Hello everyone, it's been a while, so let's first do a quick recap. The idea behind this series is to provide you with a general overview of the aircraft, including its history, combat roles, advantages and limitations. So in this episode, I'm taking you all the way back to the time of the nuclear family wife-beating and lead paint in children's toys. This is DCS Switchplane, and that's the F-86F Sabre. The F-86 is a mid-first generation jet fighter, which began life as the XP-86 in the mid-40s, took its first flight in 1947 and became operational in 1949. The F variant we have in DCS was introduced late in the Korean War in 1953, largely as a response to the shock that was the MiG-15. The main reason Western planners were completely blindsided by the appearance of the MiG-15 was due to their experiences in World War II. You see, during World War II, the Soviet forces struggled not only with an invasion, but also with equipment that was vastly inferior to that of their allies, and most importantly, that of their enemy. It was a system governed by paranoia where innovation was treated with the utmost suspicion, and any form of critique yielded much the same result as accepting a free holiday to Me Too Island from Jeffrey Epstein. As a result, when North Korea invaded the South, the UN allies anticipated a fairly rapid and decisive victory. Even more so in the era, Soviet aircraft had a reputation for being vastly inferior and held together by rubber bands and correct party thought. The unexpected arrival of the MiG-15 led to F-86 squadrons being rushed to Korea, and it was noted during combat that they were a fairly even match. But breaking even in warfare is like willingly joining a game of Soggy Biscuit. Might go well for a while, but you never know when you're going to end up eating somebody else's load. In the opinion of many pilots, the F variant, with its increased high and low speed maneuverability, provided the F-86 with a slight advantage over the MiG-15. The F-86 built on North American's hugely successful track record with the P-51 fighter from World War II. As with the P-51, it was designed to be fast and easy to operate, and had a canopy that provided excellent all-round visibility. Like the P-51, it had a semi-automatic gyro sight, which could be caged or uncaged as desired, and was linked to whichever weapon system was being used. Like all US aircraft, the cockpit has an extremely logical layout, with instruments that can be read and understood at a glance. The F-86F was a fighter-bomber, so it was deployed in air superiority defence and ground attack roles. So now as I half arsedly demonstrate some of its applications, let's move on to the top trump statistics. Well obviously it's a first generation single seat swept wing fighter with a range of 2,584 kilometers. It has a top speed of Mach 0.9 at sea level and a service ceiling of 15,850 meters. The primary armament of the F-86 is the 650 caliber Browning machine guns in the nose. The machine guns in themselves are devastating in the way they deliver their bullet bukkake on both ground and air targets. It can also carry two GAR-8 rear-aspect heat-seeking air-to-air missiles on the wing routes. Be cognizant of the fact that the GAR-8 was just a prototype in many ways. It may chase its intended target, it may chase down some poor fucker in a parachute having a cigarette, or it may go all Icarus mode and start chasing the sun. You can also carry 500-pound bombs, explosive rockets, smoke rockets, and of course fuel tanks. To sum up, the F-86 is an extremely stable weapons platform. The F-86 is equipped with an AN-APG-30 radar ranging unit. It's not a cert radar, it's just a ranging unit and helps provide a targeting solution. When it comes to defensive equipment, you have a control stick, which you should move in such a way so as the other fucker can't hit you. The F-86 had a 45-year service life, with the last user being Bolivia. When it comes to users, practically everybody had it. Kind of like your mum, and also kind of like your mum. When they were finished using it, they passed it on to poorer neighbours. It's other your mum-like quality is the sheer amount of fights it has been in, but unlike your mum, it has never taken a shit in the back of a police car afterwards. 7,800 units of all variants of the F-86 were produced over a seven-year period from 1949 to 1956. The DCS F-86 is very easy to fly and its systems are very easy to learn and understand. With its shallow learning curve, the F-86 is ideal for beginners as a first jet and also well suited to training in the aspects of old style navigation, gunnery and ground attack. As a side note, don't you just fucking hate when an AI jet steals the kill you've been reeling in for the last five minutes? Considering it's a 1950s jet, the range of munitions are pretty decent. Just don't expect to be doing any laser guided or GPS bombing. When it comes to multiplayer suitability, it's definitely an aircraft of its era, so it's going to shine in early Cold War servers. Obviously, against modern aircraft, if you haven't got an orifice for them to stick things in, they'll make you one. 
Notwithstanding the fact that it's an agile aircraft and a great fighter, the F-86 doesn't really have the thrust response for aerobatics. As we come into land, we'll try to figure out what kind of people would suit the F-86. Now obviously if you're playing pretend pilot, your status as a person is questionable at best. But for the sake of the video, we'll attribute agency and temporarily validate your existence. The F-86 was very much a bridging point between World War II and the modern jet fighter era. It was the first aircraft to use the GAR-8 air-to-air missile, which was first used in the Straits of Taiwan crisis in 1958. However, it was primarily designed as a gunfighter, and that's what it's best at. It fits into that time frame before missiles became the primary air-to-air -air weapon, and guns were relegated to a mere afterthought at best. In many ways, it was the last aerial gunfighter. It has those classic US 1950s looks, when everything was designed with a sort of optimistic futurism in mind. Even if the engine sounds like that thing your dad keeps hidden in his tool shed. Which incidentally in the 1950s were euphemistically known as Martelades. Today we call them vibrators of course, but your dad calls his 8 inch anal intruder Bert. <laughs> 